Chapter 7 The Lamian Temple Nuln, the Imperial City The woman Narcissa fascinated Skellen. She was an enigma. She moved freely among the living, while he was forced to hide in the gutters and the Unterbauch beneath the Altstadt, eating off scraps while she played the social butterfly, moving from arm to arm of the rich and influential, laughing, charming and seductive. They loved her. Night after night, he spied on her from the shadows, watching her nocturnal promenade with actors, merchants, aristocrats, and men of undeniable power. She gravitated towards those who had power, or had some kind of influence over the power mongers. No one seemed to notice her nature. Certainly, there was none of the hysteria that would have accompanied Skellen revealing his presence to the cattle. They adored Narcissa. They flocked to her, feted her and pandered to her, all in the hope of getting closer to her flame, that they might bask in her glory. Though, of course, if they succeeded in getting too close, Skella knew they would get burned. But how many moths cared about that as they flocked to the flame? She was clever, ruthlessly cunning and selective in her feeding pattern. He quickly realized she was feeding off each and every one of the gentleman callers he saw her with. A little here, a little there, a kiss turned overly playful, a cut tenderly administered. There were ways of drawing blood that they didn't even notice. Narcissa was tender, loving, and amused by their jokes, and she made them all feel like fortunate fools. It amazed Skellen that none of them noticed just how too good to be true the Lamian was. Still, the cattle were not the brightest of creatures. Occasionally he followed her back to her chambers and would sit while she put on a show for him, seducing the bright young things and then taking what she wanted in return for what they wanted. He appreciated her performances, but resisted the urge to take a lead role in her little tragedy of passion. Over nights of watching, Skellen came to realize that she was not alone, far from it. When he knew what to look for, it became easier to spot them. During his talking of Narcissa, she encountered perhaps fifteen of her kind, blood-sucking females, seducing their way into positions of influence in the hierarchy of Nuln. Walking still pained him. The witch-hunter's bolt had left its mark, the head buried deep in his arse. He had pulled it out, but the damn thing was tipped with silver, so it had buried deep inside and refused to heal. So he walked with a limp, dragging his left leg slightly. It added to the illusion, though, and who spotted him would have assumed naturally that he was some sort of cripple left to beg, following in the mayhem of civil war. Some nights he followed Narcissa, other nights he followed one of the younger girls. They were all curiously similar, beautiful, more beautiful than the courtesans and hangers-on that had flocked to Conrad, most certainly, and easily as beautiful as Vlad's own Isabella, who, in Skellan's memories, was, of course, an exquisite beauty. He had never thought to see such beauty in the flesh again. The darkness held, refusing to give way to dawn. It was cold, and winter was close. A horse-drawn carriage rumbled past his hiding place. The animal's hooves sparked on the cobbles, and streamers of steam coiled out of its flared nostrils. It stamped hard on the ground, whinnying. Skellen backed away into deeper shadow, willing the beast to walk on. The horse shied, kicking out, and then came down, breaking into a canter. The carriage driver pulled back the reins and cried, Oh, girl! The horse didn't calm until it was well past Skellen's hiding place. The clouds were thick, promising snow. Skellen walked in the shadows, never far from the woman's side. She knew he was there. Still he refused to step out into the false glow of the street lights. He felt uncomfortable, the beast stalking beauty. He had to remind himself that she was no damsel. The woman was every bit the predator he was. More so, perhaps, as she fed on countless men, keeping them alive as long as they furthered her ambitions. There was a callousness to it that was exciting to him. He was moving into familiar territory. It felt like an age since he had hunted these streets with Manfred, but they had not changed so much. 
he remembered with a sly smile the various tastes of the family Leibowitz as they had succumbed. The night of the long knives had been like no other. He had reveled in the calling. They had died in so many inventive ways, defenestrated, despoiled and degraded, that the ingenuity of the murders challenged him even now. It sent a thrill of pleasure for Skellen just thinking about it. Indeed, the city still reeled from it. The influence of the family had been severely weakened, to the point that a splinter of the family had emerged with a variant pronunciation of their name, Liebewitz. It was a subtle difference in tonal delivery, but it set them apart from the tragedy. Rumor had it that it was a half-brother of one of the dead that had surfaced from somewhere to claim the family fortunes, and with no one to stop him, he had succeeded. There were all sorts of suppositions about him having been drummed out of the family when they were still alive, but Skellen wasn't interested. The original pronunciation of the name had all but died out, it seemed. But then, few liked to be reminded of the horrors Skellen and von Karstein had visited upon the city. It was natural that the survivors would try to distance themselves from that a dark time. It had been then that he had learned the truth about the stranger he travelled with, and about his hungers, that it was Manfred, Vlad's firstborn. Soon after that, Manfred left him to travel into the lands of the dead, in search of the dark wisdom of the great necromancer Nagash. She led him through the Sonder district, into the Smalls quarter. Businesses became few and far between, and the houses grew gradually more impressive, with colonnades and almost skeletal stone structures. A great many of the houses were dominated by sharply pointed ogive arches, ribbed vaults, clustered columns, sharply pointed spires, flying buttresses, and decorative detail. On one such mansion, Skellen saw grim-faced gargoyles, and on another what appeared to be butterflies attacking a terrified man. It was all an exercise in indulgence, a way of showing off the owner's wealth. It was gratuitous and ugly to the eye. Further removed from the press of people, it became colder too. He drew his collar up, covering half of his face. The cold was no real discomfort. It was more the illusion of fitting in. One of the cattle seeing him wrapped up against the elements would think nothing of it, just another poor sod in the cold, making him instantly forgettable. The alternative... Skellen standing on the corner in his shirt oblivious to the cold would stick in the mind of any who happened to see him. She stopped to a set of imposing iron gates, easing them open and slipping through. A serpent had been woven around the black iron bars of either gate, fangs barred in fret. Skellen did not follow, at least not directly. He waited across the street from the iron gates, watching. The mansion was walled off. The wall was nine feet high and topped with creepers and flowing vines. The trick was making it look as though he belonged. An interloper stood out a mile if he acted like one. Skellen was not by nature a patient man, though. Waiting went against the grain. He looked up and down the street for a good spot from which to carry out his surveillance. The street was empty, save for two carriages. Lime trees lined the far side of the road. The lime was a fascinating species of tree, set to grow on unmarked graves. The wind dragged through the leaves, creating an unnerving sorceress that sighed through the trees. He was grateful that there were no horses or dogs for him to concern himself with. He walked slowly across the cobbled street, approaching the gate. The wall, he saw, was actually topped with shards of broken glass that were hidden beneath the flowering vines. A few of the broken pieces poked through the green. The snake appeared to be made out of copper, the elements having oxidized it a bilious shade of green, and they were deceptively well-crafted, cast from a single mold, and used as a sheaf on the iron bar. He touched one of the copper snake's teeth. It was sharp enough to draw a bead of blood, with the least bit of pressure. Skellon focused his senses, picking out the sweet fragrance of a woman's perfume and the damp of bark surrendering to mold, with a faint overlay of a more astringent musk. It took him a moment to isolate it. Cat's foot, or codweed, as they called it back home. It was an aroma he hadn't smelled in the longest time. 
Lisbeth had worn it as a cure-all, good for loosening bowels and efficacious against even the most potent snake bites. He heard a caw of a crow, the rustle of wind through the leaves, and a more distant murmur of water. He felt the first snowflake of the night on his upturned cheek. Skellen looked at the sky. A storm was coming. He eased open the iron gate, pushing it back on protesting hinges, and slipped into the grounds of the mansion house. The grounds were well tended, the rose bushes dead-headed, the japonicas cut back, even the vines dinging on the facade of the manse were well maintained, in a careful state of managed disrepair, giving the old house an edge of wildness that Skellen found appealing. Left of the serpentine drive lay a small lake, frozen over, and behind it, an architectural folly that acted as a small boathouse. On the right were more gardens, a grove of beech trees, and a huge stone mausoleum. He skirted the high wall, keeping to the fringe of the well-cultivated garden, until he reached the mausoleum. A line of gravestones stood like broken teeth across the front of the building, giving it something of a grim smile. Each of the tombstones was engraved with the mark of the snake. It was obviously some sort of family crest, tied for who knows how long to the old house. The motto, Es liegt im Blut, was carved into the lintel above the mausoleum's door. It runs in the blood. Skellen couldn't help but smile at the obvious irony of the words. He tried the door, but it was sealed. Instead of forcing his way in, he sat with his back to one of the gravestones, watching the comings and goings of the house and its nocturnal visitors. They came and went in pairs and alone, the women of the night. It seemed they all returned to the manse after feeding, to share whatever they had learned with whoever dwelled there, almost certainly their hidden mistress, just as Manfred had assumed. The manse evidently served as the focus for their infiltration of the echelons of Nuln society. Again he was disturbed, that the Lamians could live in such obvious opulence and not attract any attention. The depth of their deception was staggering. Flakes of snow were drifting down, whipping up over the top of the gravestone and away, melting before they could reach the ground. Skellen wrapped his cloak around him and pulled the hood up over his head so that only the broken profile of his nose protruded. He itched at the leather patch across his eye, Judging by the moon's position, it was well past the middle of the night. Despite, or because of, the lateness of the hour, the manse was far from deserted. He watched as two young debutants in high boots and long fur coats walked arm in arm out of the main house. They talked lightly, giggling as they walked around the rim of the lake. Together they slipped through the gate and back out into the city proper, destined, no doubt, for some aristocratic bed somewhere. The trailing edge of their laughter reached him as they passed by on the other side of the wall. Still he waited. More women came through the gate, more left. The women frequently turned and seemed to stare right at him, as though sensing his presence in the grounds, but none saw him. Finally, Narcissa emerged from the house. Skellen detached himself from the shadows and moved up behind her, catching the Lamian by the throat as he wrapped his other arm around her waist. He leaned in close, whispering in her ear, My master would meet with your mistress, Lamian. The woman didn't flinch. Then perhaps he would care to ask instead of sending his brute to force an invitation? Skellen added pressure to her throat, knowing even as he did so that she had no need of breath. Frustration caused him to squeeze savagely enough to crush her windpipe. He felt her stiffen against him, resisting. Beneath the pretty curves, her musculature was a match for iron. He struggled to hold her. Make it happen. The Eternal does not see commoners, vampire, Narcissa said, sneering. Oh, I think she will make an exception for my commoner. Do you think we don't know who you are? Who your uncommon master is? You really are a clueless brute, aren't you, John Skellen? How could you... She twisted, 
so that her mouth was beside his ear, reversing, reversing the roles of captive and captor. Her eyes, he saw, were different, one glacious blue, the other flecked with hazel. The imperfection only served to make her all the more appealing. We are observers. We watch. We listen. We do not bluster and preen, craving attention and approval for our wickedness. We simply observe. It is amazing what you could learn by paying attention to the world around you. Of course, you wouldn't know, as you are too busy playing the thug for your master. Does he call you whelp? I could end your life right here with my bare hands, woman. Do not push me into something you would not live long enough to regret. Skellen rasped. See? Bluster. You need my help to see to it that your master, the new Count of Drakenhof, if I am not mistaken, and I am seldomly mistaken, meets with my mistress. Do you think ending my life would please either of them? One might go as far to suggest it would bring a world of hurt down upon you. So, why don't you try again? Tell me why I should help you. You have a good thing here, you and your kind. But don't make the mistake of believing it will last forever, Narcissa. It won't. I can promise you that. So you threaten me again, in an attempt to earn my trust and win my support? You really are quite the animal, and I don't mean that as a compliment. She turned easily in his arms, as he arched back, releasing the beast within. His face twisted as he grabbed her by the throat and yanked her head back. He lunged forwards, sinking her teeth into her throat and tearing out a mouthful of her tainted flesh. He tasted her black blood, swallowed gluttonously, and then pulled his head back. Skellan savored a look of fear in her eyes. To be feared was an intensely erotic feeling. You taste luxurious. Now, he said, licking her blood from his lips. My master will meet with your mistress. You will make it happen. She nodded, all the fight gone from her body. They were not equals. For all that she might have wanted to pretend otherwise, playing the aristocrat, Skellen had shown that the beast was more than a match for beauty. It had taken a single moment of blistering savagery to impose his will on her. She had buckled, leaving him dominant. Beyond the city gates, peasants, fired up by the witch-hunter Moroi, stormed the Strigony caravan. The winter night could not have been bleaker. A thin pattern of snow had fallen, but instead of adding an edge of romance to the city streets, it only served to drape a ghostly veil of despair over a world locked in winter. A bitter wind chased through the narrow streets, sending corkscrews of snow twisting across the frozen cobbles. They ran through those narrow, frozen streets, shouting and screaming, torches blazing. They swarmed over the Strigony camp, pulling caravan doors open and shattering windows. As the mob mentally gripped them, righteousness turned to fury. A thick-muscled townsman threw his burning brand through the door he just yanked open. He stood there, waiting for the fire to catch, blocking the exit. As the travelers emerged from their caravan, Choking and coughing on the smoke, the townsmen thrust another burning brand into their faces, blinding them with fire. As they backed away, he tossed a second brand into their home, while around him others followed suit, throwing open caravan doors and shattering windows, setting light to the caravan. The screams only served to ignite their anger, the mob feeding off their fear. They plunged into the burning caravans and dragged the strigony out by the hair, kicking and screaming. One weasel of a man thrust his firebrand into the face of an old grey-haired crone. The air quickly smelled of burned meat and brimstone as her hair charred away from her scalp. Is it here, Moroi? Can you feel its presence? Arminus Famberg whispered, his breath conjuring wraiths of mist to hand like a veil between the living and the dead. The violence of the mob frightened the man, but it was a necessary evil. They couldn't hope to flush the beast out without it. The waning moon was a sickly silver eye, barely floating above the rooftops. Vamberg ignored the icy chill warming its way into his heart and wiped the sweat from his brow before it could freeze there. His lips were chapped from the wind's perpetual kiss. 
Moroi nodded once. A cruel wind drove the clouds through the sky, continually masking and unmasking the moon, so that the trees lining the street appear to shamble like rows of gnarled corpses. Bring out the beast! Moroi cried. Others took up the chant, banging on the sides of the caravans. Snow began to fall thicker, a flurry blowing up into a storm, and from out of the center of the storm came the beast. It was not a giant, and did not have two heads or blood-dripping fangs. It was a warrior, with a huge double-headed warhammer in its meaty fists. It was not the wolf he had chased, but the sickness surging through his body told Moroi that the man walking towards him through the snow and fire was most assuredly a vampire. The courage leaked out from some of the living as they felt the power of the vampire, the dark aura of fear that the creature exuded. Some fell to their knees, while others scrambled back, trying to hide within the shadows close to the walls. Only Moro and Vamberg stood their ground, unflinching. Funny thing, death, Jarek said, his voice bereft of inflection. You would think it would hurt more. Then, almost wistfully, he added, Have you come to put me out of my misery? I should like that, but it's not time. There are still things I must do. Your life is forfeit, vampire, Moroi said. I have no life, mortal, Jarek answered. His smile widened, his bloodless lips peeling slowly back from the white of his carnivorous teeth. Isn't that why you are here? Don't do this, please, don't. Just walk away from here. Let this be one of those rare occasions when all these others live. You cannot live if you are not alive. I meant you. Moroi raised his handhold crossbow and aimed it at the beast's heart. He fired two bolts, less than a second apart, and he knew, even as he squeezed down on the trigger, that his aim was true. Jarek's hand lashed out, deflecting the first bolt so that it spun harmlessly wide and snatching the second out of the air. He snapped it derisively. Vamberg pulled a flask of blessed water from his satchel, unstoppered it, and hurled it into Jarek's face, babbling a line of prayer. The beast's skin hissed and steamed where the water hit, but it did not slow his advance. He came at Vamberg first, surging forwards, the monster tearing out from beneath his skin as he launched himself into a blistering attack the man had no earthly hope of fending off. It was brutal, savage, ugly, and tragic. The man threw up his hands, desperately trying to deflect Jarek's fury, but it was useless. Jarek's fingers sheared through half of Vamberg's face, ripping his nose and half of his cheek away in a bloody tear. The man's screams were hideous to hear. His blood soaked the settling snow. The speed of the attack was dizzying, the ferocity nauseating. Crouching over him, Jarek grabbed both sides of the man's head in his hands, and snapped his neck clean in two with a savage twist. He dropped the man and reared back and howled. He did not feed. Indeed, for the shocking nature of the attack, more shocking still was that the beast retreated from the spilled blood. There was a second when the entire street was locked in shock paralysis, and then Moroi hurled himself at the beast, only to be battered back almost inconsequentially. He sprawled in the thin layer of snow, scuffing it up as he scrambled, trying to get back to his feet. Jarek rose, standing over the witch-hunter. The crowd of vigilantes stared, torches spitting sparks that danced high into the air. The sparks conjured wraiths of steam that spun away in tight spirals. None dared move. Their pitchforks and makeshift weapons hung slackly in their hands, their wooden stakes clattered to the floor as real, real, Genuine terror wormed its way into their heart. Do not make me kill you, man. I have no taste for blood. There is something I must do. Then I will seek you out and you can end my life. If you try to stop me, I will kill you. I promise you that. You have my word, as a wolf of Wolric. Your word? Moroi spat, nursing his bruised and bloody chin. You kill my friend and expect me to let you live? On your word? 
No, I expect you to come after me and die. I just don't want to be forced to kill you. I have enough blood on my hands. I have no desire to add yours. He turned his back on the witch hunter, as though goading him to try. You are an affront to nature, Moroy swore. And I will come after you, beast. I will come after you and kill you. That I promise. For a promise, it sounded dreadfully hollow, even to the witch hunter's ears. None of the would-be vampire slayers stopped him as Jarek walked away into the darkness. Skellen stared at the curious bird. It was neither crow nor raven, but some kind of unnatural blend between the carrion eaters and something else entirely. It was a stride, a hideous cross between bat, bird and wasp, with four small pincer-like legs. It was rusty red, with a dangling proboscis. The name meant owl in the old tongue, a nocturnal bird. In more modern places, it meant witch, which was decidedly more fitting, Skellen thought. He was uncomfortable around the strange bird, but Manfred seemed to have taken a liking to communicating through it of late. Is it arranged? The Lamians have agreed to facilitate a meeting between you and the one she calls the Eternal. Good, good. You have done well, my friend. I am close. I should enter the city within the week. I don't know. There is a peculiar tension to the place these last few days, like something is primed to explode. It makes me uncomfortable. The humans are restless. No doubt it is some part of their never-ending quest to tear their civilization apart. But be that as it may, I think we should exercise caution. For one, I would avoid coming in over land, like the plague. Better, I think, to enter via the tunnels. There is a concealed jetty that disembarks directly into a vast underground labyrinth beneath the city. Indeed, Manfred agreed thoughtfully. It would also serve us to be cautious around these Lamian women. I do not trust them. They spend their lives lying and trading information for power. I would not put it past the bitches to sell you out to the Imperials in return for turning a blind eye to their presence in the city. They have the fools eating out of their hands while they eat out of their necks. Then pity the fools who get in my way. There was no arrogance to the statement. It was delivered flat, matter of fact, and all the more chilling for it. Still, the least they know of your movements, the better. Agreed. Something is disturbing you, is it not? The bird thing craned its neck curiously, peering at Skellen. Its scrutiny made him uncomfortable. There was some kind of riot this past night. A strigony caravan was burned to the ground. The gypsies ran out of town. I believe someone told them I was sheltering within the Strigony caravan, and that was why the caravan burned. They know you are in the city? No, well, not exactly. A damn witch hunter hit me with a silver arrow. I know he is looking for me. That was unfortunate. Manfred's disappointment was palpable. What do you intend to do? Oh, I intend to string him up, of course. Good. See to it it is done before my arrival. Moroy could not find it in himself to mourn his friend. Arminus Vamberg's grave looked like a black wound in the earth, surrounded as it was by three inches of snow. Winter had taken a hold of Nuln. Vamberg's coffin was a simple wooden box, bare of any ornamentation. It rested beside a hole on ropes that would be used to lower it into the ground. Moroy couldn't take his gaze from the coffin. He couldn't accept that his friend, his only friend, lay inside, waiting to be interred, dead. The beast had done this, murdered Vamberg without compunction or guilt. It was a stone-cold killer, and yet it promised to return, to find him, in order to die at his hand when its work was done. There was a surreal quality to the events of the last night that turned his thoughts inside out. The priest of the Garden of Moor, an old man dressed in a long black robe of mourning, read words meant to comfort him. Into thy hands, O Moor, we commend the loyal servant Arminus, our dear brother, 
May he serve at your side in death as he did in life, steadfast and true. We beseech thee to protect the soul from the devilries of those who would extinguish his light like a candle that has burned out, rather than renew it like the blazing fire that is faith. A gust of wind churned through the garden, drowning out the priest's frail voice. Moroy helped the sexton lower the coffin into the grave. He bent low against the bitter wind. He told himself that the tears on his cheek were due to the stinging wind, even though he knew they weren't. There was no comfort to be had in the ritual. He cast a handful of dirt over the coffin lid, and left before the old priest had finished his supposedly soothing words. He walked slowly back towards the temple. There were no temple guards, which he found curious, even for a small temple. It was uncommon in this uncertain time for the holy houses to be left undefended. To attack one faith was an almost certain way to undermine a man's courage, and the fearful man died most easily. Moray shrugged off his momentary unease and opened the door. As he stepped inside, the feeling of nausea was overwhelming. He walked slowly through the narfex. There was an unnerving quality to the silence. The old temple was half in shadow, the small windows not generous with the light. It was cold, as cold as it was outside. The chapel was austere. He bowed low to the marble statue of Moore as he passed by into the nave. The god turned a blind eye to his tears. Moray rose and walked down to the central aisle, listening. There was a sense of wrongness about the place. His eyes roved across the tiny chapel. With every step, the pain in his skull increased, the blood swelling against the bone. The air in the temple smelled of snow and something else, something more redolent and utterly out of place. Decay. Halfway between the altar and the door, a man stepped out of the shadows. The man was tall and wiry, his thin-lipped face sharp and laced with scars. He moved with a pronounced limp. Moroy's heart skipped a beat as the man moved menacingly towards him. His features were bony, lending an angular quality to his face, and the black leather pouch covered one eye. His presence was repulsive. No crossbow... No crossbow today, witch hunter? No crossbow... No crossbow today, witch hunter? Moroy reached for where the crossbow ought to have been, only it wasn't there. It was back in his room. He hadn't wanted to attend the funeral of his friend armed. It had felt wrong to honor death with the tools of killing so close at hand. So much for respect. Moroy cursed his stupidity as the beast came at him. He should have known the vampire would hunt him out at his weakest moment. You're not... Not what? The man interrupted. Not him. You're not the vampire, the wolf. Oh, believe me, witch hunter, I am all the vampire you'll ever need. A moment later, the creature had him by the throat and leaned in close, the sickness of his fetid breath harsh on Moroy's face. The witch hunter struggled desperately to raise his arm, to push the beast away, but the vampire's grip was like iron. He held him close in a parody of a lover's embrace. Moroy kicked and writhed futilely in its grasp. The beast shook his head, tutting slowly, and hurled Moroy back across the row of pews. Moroy screamed in agony as he came down hard on the wooden backs of the pews, bones in his spine cracking. Oh, don't die on me, little man. I have such pain to show you. For you I shall make death exquisite suffering. More will welcome you with open arms, overwhelmed by your agonies. They will be legendary even amongst the dead. The vampire stepped up close, leaning down to stare at the witch hunter. Folded over the back of one of the upturned pews, he tutted again. The agony was blinding. Moroy couldn't move his hands. They hung lifelessly at his side. He tried to concentrate on moving his fingers, but had no control over them. The pain was savage. It blossomed out from the center of his spine. He couldn't support his head, and his back was broken. The beast hauled Moroy up by the throat, choking him 
as it lifted him bodily off the floor. I'm not letting you get away from me that easily. Moroi couldn't speak. The force of the vampire's grip crushed his windpipe. Blackness swelled up, threatening to overwhelm him, but even as he tried to lose himself, the beast denied him, hurling him again. The witch hunter's head cracked sickeningly as he hit the floor of the stone altar. His vision blurred, failing completely in his left eye. He felt a warm stickiness of blood mat in his hair and spread slowly down his neck. The last thing he saw was the beast grinning as it toyed with his throat, seconds before ripping it open.